Mark Bernardin. Hey, ho, oh, hey. As as is the case, and will be until uh, mid December, I think. Kevin is out on tour, and so it, it falls to me to hold down uh, the the world of Fat Man Beyond and Black Man Beyond. And today it's going to be a special one. Today, um, there's we have one guest. We're not going to do Q and A. We are just going to talk. It's a craft episode of uh, Black Man Beyond, where uh, where my guest and I, Ed Brubaker, who I'm sure you all know, and if you don't know, go do your research. Um, but um, comic book writer, TV writer, animation writer, graphic novelist. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some other forms of, of, of word smithery he's done that we'll discover uh, over the course of the next hour or so. Um, and I can't wait to do it because every time I talk to Ed, we, we end up just talking about writing and craft and the business and all that stuff for like an hour before we get on to talk about whatever we're going to talk about. But he's got a new graphic novel to push. We got a big conversation to have. Before we do that, we've got to read a quick ad. Um, thanks to our uh, uh, our sponsor for tonight's episode of Black Man Beyond is Blue Chew. The nights are getting longer, kids, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. Listen, Blue Chew is honestly giving us the best ad copy in the game. Um, they know who they are. They know their audience. They're not fucking around. So, yes, that's right. This episode is, this episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate. And that's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready for whenever an opportunity arises. Process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. Best part? All online, no visit to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And if you're a patriot, uh, Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Have better sex with Blue Chew. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code FATMAN at checkout. Just pay file of shipping. That's bluechew.com, B L U E C H E W.com, promo code FATMAN. Receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And as always, we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. And scene. We did it, you guys. We did an ad all without Kevin. And you know how long that ad took? 45 seconds. <laughs> who's who's better than us? Who's better than you and me? I don't know, um, but I know who's better than me at writing, and that person is my guest today, Ed Brubaker. Hey, Ed, how are you? That was a, the greatest intro of all time. I, as a child, I dreamed that one day I would be interviewed right after an ad for erectile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> we're making dreams come true today Ed. we're making dreams come true. i was like this is actually the perfect thing for my cd <laughs> prime comics <laughs> <laughs> um how are you i'm good how are you doing you know it's uh it's a it's a beautiful day in zamunda it is somehow 94 degrees in los angeles uh in the the, the bottom half of october um but you know i'm i'm getting to make stuff up for money yeah, exactly. That is that is it. Exactly. Here, I want to before I forget, I want to show the new Reckless book to the viewers out there. This just came out last week, Ooh. or this week. I can't remember this week or last week. Whatever week it is, this week or last week. Well, you are you're like purely in the graphic novel business these days, right? Like that's that's how you make comics. That's that's sort of how yeah we transitioned uh, sort of by accident out of uh, monthly comics to just doing graphic novels uh, during the early days of the pandemic. We we had a graphic novel like a shorter like seventy two page book that we had put together. Uh, and it went to the printer the day that the entire industry shut down. <laughs> and so it was just sitting there for months. And I just thought, well, what are we going to do? And I, you know, out of a panic, I'm like, I'll just start writing a graphic novel series. And so, <laughs> you know, we did five of these reckless books and uh, it's a couple months under two years. We put out five, like 150 page uh, Pulp Fiction graphic novels about this, you know, 
sort of, you know, private eye sort of criminal <laughs> <laughs> who who does the right thing through the course of 80s LA. Um, and they've just been a blast. But yeah, it became, you know, once I figured if the market for comics somehow didn't come back, we'd, you know, try to sell it to a book publisher or something. And then when the market did come back, the graphic novels were just taking off like hotcakes for us in the comic stores. And um, just kind of instinctively, we were like, okay, let's just keep doing this now because, you know, I think both of us, Sean and I really enjoyed not having to stop at the end of, you know, every 24 to 32 pages and do another cover and, you know, only having to think of like a couple covers a year is a lot easier for both of us. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think just the momentum of writing a longer book is just, you know, this far into our career, we're so used to, we've been working together for 20 years now, a little over 20 years. Right. So I think, you know, every time we try to do something a little bit different, um, but, but yeah, doing, you know, just going to graphic novels, I feel like it's freed up some other part of my brain that, you know, I've spent my whole life reading and drawing and writing comics. And it's like, I get to sort of experiment around with the form a little bit more than I was able to even just a couple of years ago by, you know, just publishing it in a different format. It's mm -hmm. kind of crazy how how simple something like that is. Um, you've been, you have to have been making comics at this point for what, 30 years or so, 35 years? I started publishing comics. I was, I, when I grew up, I only started writing because I wanted to have stories to draw Mm. And because I wanted to be a penciler when I was a little kid, I wanted to pencil Spider-Man or Captain America or Iron Fist. Eventually, I came around to deciding I wanted to pencil the X-Men because that's what all the, that's what all the kids liked. Um, I never really understood. It's too many people. I was like, why would I want to draw this comic? It seems like it would be so hard. Um, <laughs> but I started writing stories for myself to draw, basically. And then. At some point in my 20s, I realized I was much more of a writer than an artist, and I just started focusing on that. I think a lot of artist friends of mine kept asking me to write stories for them, mm -hmm. and I managed to, you know, do a few of those, and I would get the art back, and it was so much better than anything I could draw that it sort of subsumed that kind of satisfaction. But, yeah, the first comic I ever put out was, like, the late 80s, actually, like, 89 or something. And Wow. I was like part of the whole like independent alternative comics movement in the early nineties in like San Francisco and Seattle. So it was very uh, <laughs> long road of comics. <laughs> Are you still a guy who outlines like what's your, what's your process when it comes to writing a comic? I, I do outline. I, I notebook. It's like somewhere between notebooking and, and asking myself questions and actually writing an outline. Like, here's the outline that I'm working on right now, which you can see some of. Hopefully that didn't spoil anything for a freeze frame. Um, <laughs> but it's like sometimes I'll be like, or maybe we do this or maybe we do that. And so I do stuff like that a lot where I I I like I I definitely I'm somewhere in between giving myself a net and leaving myself enough room to improvise while I'm actually writing too, mm -hmm. which, you know, from like TV writing, there's none of that. Like TV <laughs> writing, you have a scene by scene, beat by beat outline written out. So like that's part of the fun of doing the comics is every now and then I get to the end of a scene and I look at my notes and I'm like, I want to do something else here next instead, you know, and, and I have the freedom to just do that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like I don't, I, I always have to know where I'm headed and what the end is, mm -hmm. but I don't always have to know every single decision on the way ahead of time. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's, it, it always strikes me in talking to, to sort of veterans at it. Yeah. yeah. There's the thing you do when you're young and you're starting out where it's like, right, here's my line. Here's my, every page or writing down yeah. what's happening on each page just so I know and I can count and whatever. But then after a while, so much of that stuff becomes somewhat back brainy and yeah. secondary. Like you just, you start to know the rhythms of it and understand it. It's like, all right, well, this will take about this much room and this will feel about right. And, and yeah, giving yeah. yourself the freedom to just like, I'm going to jump off this cliff and I know I can land this particular jump. Yeah. I, I definitely during the that's been one of the interesting things about switching to graphic novels was like I do feel like the second half of each 
book so far for the last couple of years is like a slow panic attack that I messed <laughs> something up or forgot something, or I didn't leave myself enough room to finish the story or, you know, and I, I always feel like they've ended up working out, but by the time I finish any of them, I'm like, I don't know, hopefully this works. And then other people read it and tell me it's good. And I'm like, okay, good. I trust them. <laughs> um, but I definitely, you know, I, that was part of what was exciting to me was like trying to do something different. And cause like what you said, it's like, I know I'm, when I'm sitting down to write a story, I generally know if I know what the story is about or, or if, if there's like a twist ending or something that I'm trying to really land, I know instinctively I've written enough things, especially if I'm working with like Sean Phillips, who I've worked with for so long, you know, or even, but even like screenwriting, it's like, I know, I, I know enough about how to like make it, make a moment land. I'm not, I don't write with that same kind of fear or that like drive to prove myself in the same way that I might have when I was in my twenties or early thirties or something. Now I feel <laughs> like, like I write yeah, to, and it's like, as long as I'm keeping myself interested, I am assuming, you know, I know enough about how to do this that I'm probably not screwing it up. And if I do, well, hopefully I'll be able to figure to, to notice it before it prints and I can fix it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I spend the month before a book goes to print just going over it with a fine tooth comb to just take, take anything out that bumps me or improve the flow of dialogue in a scene or just weird little things like that. But, um, but yeah, I definitely feel like the, the, um, this part of my life as a writer, like being, you know, like having been doing it for 20 something years now, I, I definitely have the kind of confidence that when I start writing a book, I'm not worried that I'm going to get 30 pages in and be like, I don't know where this is going. I, I, I'm not going to write this and start something else. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, I had started to get, you know, I, I, I started to feel the way, because remember hearing Harrison Ford describe his performance is like, listen, I'm not an artist. I'm a, I'm a craftsman. It's like, I'm not, like, I'm not gonna, like, I don't do what De Niro does. I don't do what Brando did. I don't do what these great actors have done. But I can build you a performance that will hold, that will serve the function that it needs to serve in this particular movie. Um, I think he's selling himself short for the little, short yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But that feeling of, like, every time I sit down to a, to a TV script, even a comic script, it's like, all right, what's the, I can build you a chair. Yeah, I know how a chair works. Like I can build you a thing that'll hold your ass and it'll keep you afloat. And like, it's not going to be a, a restoration chair. It's not going to be a mid-century modern chair. It's not going to be a, a Louis the Fourteenth chair. But it's going to yeah. be a chair. Like it'll do yeah. the thing. <laughs> then we can sort of like get to to filigrees and buffing and and cushioning all that shit. But like, it's going to do the job it was designed to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You it's know, not going to be, it's not going to be a footstool by accident. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't maybe make you a slide. Like, no. I yeah. <laughs> it turns into a slide when you sit on it. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's always my like, oh, you know, I'm confident in the fact that I can build you a chair. Now let's see yeah. how nice a chair I can get for you, you know, over the course of three or four drafts of whatever particular show or, or even comic that it is. Like, no, the yeah. chair part's there. I feel like that's the biggest, you know, the 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 hardest thing for me going from comics into like screenwriting, like film or TV, and the thing that I, you know, for me always still going strive from for, comics I mean, I strive into with everything like screenwriting, to find, like, like whatever moments of like human truth you're putting into these things. For for my comics, I'm always trying to write generally like something that I feel like needs to come out of me almost like therapy or something like I don't do therapy so I write a bunch of stories instead that are mining like all these dark fucked up things in my head mm. and nice things too mm. <laughs> but they're they're easier to mine um, <laughs> but uh but it's like I I feel like if I you know if I don't write regularly I start to lose my mind a little bit but I notice mm. with like TV and screenwriting, there's a, it's like, how do you find those moments when you're doing something like, like when I was a writer on Westworld, like there was nothing about season one of Westworld, as much as there are things that everybody in that writing room, like put up on the board and that ended up in the show, like, 
that was a big learning experience for me because I realized when you're not the person who's in charge of the show, or at least the co-person who's in charge of the show, everybody else that's there in that writing room is just there to help them write their show. Mm -hmm. Like you can talk about it any number of different ways, but as a writer, what you're really there for is for your writing skills and hopefully your whatever people skills you have and your ability to sort of try to, you know, try to write like them or try to help them do the thing that they need to do. And, you know, with like that show, like Lisa and Jonah had like a five season outline already. Like I'm watching the newest season and I'm like, oh, that's stuff we talked about in week one. <laughs> <laughs> like this is insane. They actually stuck to it. But um, but it was a big shift from doing comics where even writing Captain America or Batman or something like that, you pretty much get to write your story for those characters, for those comics, because you're on these tight deadlines. It's a little bit looser. Like I wrote Captain America for eight years. Mm. So pretty much it was to the point where if other people wanted to use him, they had to run it by me and my editor especially with like the winter soldier and Bucky, like everybody had to run everything by me and right. I would, you know, request dialogue changes and stuff. If I thought something was too, you know, out of character. Um, but film and TV, it's like, there's so many different voices involved and it's like, how do you find a way to bring your voice into these moments? It's like, cause you always want to be, I mean, the, I'll I'll pick the greatest screen, one of the greatest screenwriters in the world. You always want to be Charlie Kaufman, you know, when you're turning the script in. You want your you want your episode to be the one where everybody's like, "Holy shit, we got this guy! <laughs> What's he doing on this show?" You know? <laughs> but uh, arguably, like whatever episode of of Westworld Charlie Kaufman wrote would probably not have been filmable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, Either the for budgetary is... reasons or just depression. <laughs> totally, because like, you're right. The job is you're helping somebody else execute their vision. A lot of people don't realize that too. And I, you talk to a lot of younger writers coming in and I remember the first one, of, definitely the first month on the job, there were, there were several times I got pulled aside during the first month on Westworld, at least two or three times where I got pulled aside to sort of, I was so excited to have the job and I had been writing professionally for like 20 years by the time <laughs> I got the job. So I was like, what about this? What about this? What about... I was like the the like guy everybody else in the writing room was like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> um, but I remember getting pulled aside to be like, hey, 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 you not everybody, you know, has written as much as you like, like, remember to always leave room for everyone else to pitch their ideas and don't, you know, don't get overwhelmed in those moments. And I was like, oh, that was a good learning, you know, <sighs> lesson to be to be pulled aside and told I was embarrassed, of course, but I was also like, that's that's good. And I always kept it in mind after that. Um, and I remember like Lisa on one of our first weeks that we wrapped, we were all out for like drinks at the summer like, afterwards. And she Lisa, told me on the one biggest of our thing to know, like when you're, when you're on someone else's show is to remember, give as much of yourself as you can to those, to the job and get as much experience as you can from it. But understand this isn't going to be your place to sing your song exactly. You're, <laughs> you're, you know, you're one of the Supremes. Yeah. <laughs> you're not Diana Ross. Yes. It was like an interesting like way to think about it because she was like, because otherwise you'll just get crushed by the experience. It'll be a huge disappointment for you. You won't get what you need to learn out of it. And you'll be bitter about that you didn't get to do more, you know, as opposed to, hey, you got to work on this amazing thing. And I see that a lot with like younger writers who think, you know, oh, I don't feel like I was listened to by like a showrunner or something. And it's like, well, I, I mean, talk to everybody else in the room. I'm sure they all feel that way a lot of the time, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's it's a tough job where and a showrunner is often thinking about 40 different things at the same time. They may be thinking about an actor or a budget cut that they don't tell you about. And they're looking at the board and listening to a million things and replaying like some phone message in their head about like why the actor decided not to show up that morning and how <laughs> they're trying to. So it's like, it's a really tough job, like, and watching it, you know, and then having done it with Refn like on our show and now this Batman show, like helping Bruce run that, like, you know, you just see the amount of balls that are constantly in the air and getting thrown at the showrunner to, to deal with i you know i couldn't possibly do what bruce tim is doing on the show that you and i worked on yeah know? i mean it's it's i don't remember who i was talking to it was another it was a it was a guy who had been a showrunner for a very long time 
and we were at a party and I was like, you know, the thing they don't tell us when we're starting out, because as you're a young writer who wants to get into TV, the dream is always, I want to run my own show. Yeah. Like that's, that feels like the trajectory that everybody's like, no, that's, that's us. That's the golden yeah. city. That's, that's the finish line. Yeah. What they don't tell you is that the best job in TV is like supervising producer. It's like <laughs> two rungs away from the top <laughs> where it's, you're still getting a lot of money, but nobody's calling you at 3 a.m. from the set saying that, oh my God, that person, you know, just got COVID and we had to shut down for two weeks. Yeah. Nobody's calling you because they need the fourth draft of this, this thing that's going to happen. That you're in the was, loop. Yeah, you're in the loop, but you get an email the next morning. <laughs> yeah, like, you still just get to go home. Yeah. <laughs> and that's your job. You um, don't have to give notes on the director's cut if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no. You're like, eh, I'm sure you guys will handle it. <laughs> I, I bet you it's great. Like, you're not, it's not 3 a.m. when you're on set in Prague. It's really, <laughs> and I think too, if you're going to be an executive producer or a showrunner, like, and this is all hopefully advice for, you know, people. I, I try to tell a lot of people trying to come out of comics into TV and film writing, like just be honest with them about what it's like, because it's a completely different writing experience. Yeah. You know, it's more like being, you know, like an intern at a, at a hospital or something. Sometimes like work wise, like sometimes your job is just to come to work and sit around and wait for the showrunners to need you, you know, that day because they've got a million things going on, but they want to make sure you're there for the two hours they're going to have to get in the writing room um, yeah, and like most of being a TV writer is not actually writing. Yeah, like most of being a TV writer is sitting in a conference room having a conversation for yeah. anywhere between three and eight hours a day. Yeah, sometimes longer, sometimes yeah. ten to twelve, depending on the show. It can get like video game crunch time. Yeah, um, for sure. And like, yeah, so and and the um the the thing too is like it's never done. Like you can write your script and then it's like. The showrunners doing rewrites are asking you to do rewrites. You're sh you're shooting and something's not working, so you have to do rewrites in the trailer on set and get that approved by everybody, and then get that. To, it's like the the that side of it. Like I don't think anybody should ever want to be like unless they've just got it wired like a John Wells or somebody who just mm -hmm. can do it like as if it's not even happening or something like <laughs> where they've just done it for so long. It's not a big deal. Like the amount of labor involved people don't think about. And it's like, don't do it unless it's the show you are the most passionate about. And you were like, I need to midwife this thing into existence because, you know, like a lot of people don't know that, you know, a, a showrunner or a head writer like there's, you know, they may not have their name on every script as a writer, but they've definitely written something on every script in every episode of a show, mm -hmm. like, you know, because that's part of the job is like, they're the, they're not calling up the, the writer at three in the morning to make a change that needs to get shot at six. Usually they're making that change at their hotel room next to the set, you know? So, and they're like, okay. And they're thinking of the whole season where it was the writers thinking of their episode, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's just a really demanding job. Having seen it up close, I was just like, I mean, I'm glad I was older when I started staffing on TV shows because I don't know how anyone would find their voice in that system to some degree, too. Yeah. Like, what is your voice? Like, who knew Noah Hawley would, you know, go from <laughs> go from writing on Bones to, you know, writing Fargo and figure out a way to, you know, become, I think, the you know, one of the best TV writers working and someone that definitely has like a, a point of view on everything he writes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's, you know, that that is the challenge of, you know, and you, and you mentioned before, how you bring, how you find um, enjoyment and validation and a sense of accomplishment writing somebody else's show. Like yes. how can you, how can you find your way to be that hip standing behind yeah. Gladys Knight? And it's like, you see that little thing there? That little thing there was mine. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I, I, I did that bit. That little run, that was, that was my thing. Yeah. So like, <laughs> It's like, how, oh, that was my you, idea. <laughs> but yeah, so it's how do you find the way? And it's it's different on every show. And some some shows it's just not possible. You know, yeah, a lot like, of shows are like written, uh, and people don't know this. That this is another thing that a lot of writers' rooms will do, especially on network shows that are in constant crunch, basically, mm -hmm. is the the um Frankenstein drafts where they, you know have the outline and they break the outline into, you know, see six, five or six people, you know, 
are get given scenes and write the scenes and then it's put together and then the writer of record will do a rewrite on that or a polish yeah you know, the showrunner will do a polish and that'll be the script and a lot of those people aren't credited because it's just you know that's how it that's how it's done and it's like so, I mean, there's a, probably a ton of great scripts that have been written that way. I mean, the guys on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, they said their outlines were so detailed, they felt like anyone who was in the room helping them break the script, you know, could have written any of those episodes, like, you know, and they would they would be different based on what the things that people were saying, but generally they'd be pretty similar. Right, you know, it's just the like, story we were telling. Yeah, some, I mean, some shows are more like that than others, and, you know... It's it's interesting though. Uh, as a writer, you really do have to. Coming from comics into TV, the compartmentalizing side of having been a comic book freelancer too, and having worked for Marvel in DC, really helps a lot mm. because you're able to look at the all the different episodes at the same time and plap you know map that stuff out more. If you've written eight years of like a superhero comic with continuity, it's like you that part of your brain is very helpful in a TV writer's room. You know, just the technical parts of it, if you're really into the technical craft side of writing, like that part of my brain is always so fired up, like working in a TV, <laughs> right, a TV writer's room because it's like, oh, I can help here. Like I can, you know, that's something I can really, you know, take part of and be passionate of. I remember early on when I was sort of trying to find my way in that room and in that on that show, my friend Kathleen Felter, who is like one of the best writers I know and has been around TV for 20, 30 years. Like she was a writer on House and a bunch of network shows and stuff. And uh, I think she was on Hannibal. She's been on a bunch of like Brian Fuller related things. Um, but she just told me, like, try to find one part of the show that you can sort of take more ownership of like a character that you really feel passionate about and like, you know, follow their trajectory and make sure when, when their arc is being discussed that you're, you know, getting input in that. It'll give you something to, you know, to make sure that you feel like, you know, I'm contributing here just yeah. mentally. Cause it can be a really, I mean, you watch, I mean, Writers generally temperamentally are very well suited to sitting at home alone. <laughs> so putting 10 of them in a eight or 10 of them in a room together, there's a lot of meltdowns that happen through the course of a season, depending on how long it goes to. And people yeah. don't think about that, like the anxiety of having to go to like a work job. <laughs> uh, you know, when, you're, when you're used to working, I mean, now the pandemic has made it, you know, I think, I think a lot of shows will probably only do virtual writers room for the foreseeable future still. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends a lot on on the taste of the showrunner. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I, and some of the the older ones that I end up talking to, and by older I mean people who've done it for a while, they're like, man, yeah. I can't wait to we can get back in a room. Yeah, you know, and I do, and I do feel that I do feel the there is something about being able to read a person's body language. Yeah, to 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 be able to just see all of those unwritten things because so so often being on a Zoom is waiting to talk. And like, when do, when do I get to say my, I just, oh, I used to go like pitch chicken of like two people just trying to do it at once. And then somebody's got a blink. <laughs> Whereas like, if you're in the room, like you can kind of feel when the time is right. For yeah. The yeah. A good patient, writer's room finds those, finds its own momentum kind of, or its rhythm. And yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a different, and also there's an element of group therapy to it, which I find really amazing there's always the you know what happens in the writer's room stays in the writer's room kind of thing so people mm. are other writers that you become friends with like we all end up revealing like things about ourselves and our pasts and stuff and we freely allow these things to be mined for tv shows that we don't own at all <laughs> you no. know? but that it's like oh but that moment happened and it resonates with other people in the room and we end up putting it in you know the show and it's like I think yeah. that's that's a really cool thing, and it it happens a lot less on Zoom. People are more guarded too because they're being recorded. They're they're more guarded, and they haven't like I remember uh, the the Picard room. You know, it 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 was the room that bridged the the pandemic for me. I started that show in like February, yeah, and then March hit. So like I got to meet in the room physically with people. Oh twice. wow! And then it was oh shit, we got to shut it down. We got to like everybody. All right, go home. We'll figure this out. And so I didn't really know anybody. 
Yeah. In the, we're going to sit down and have lunch together. We're going to walk to and from our cars together. We're going to have all of those times where we're not actually writing a show to yeah. kind of, it's, you know, the first week of camp. Like we never got to have that. Uh, and so every time we got on the Zoom, the Zoom always felt like work. We're here to do the thing. Let's talk about the story. Um, and then we're signing off and I'll see you later. And so, Yeah, nobody wants to stay on Zoom an extra hour and just bullshit. Yeah, you know? there's no bullshitting. There was like the five minutes. No one of brings donuts every Friday. <laughs> That's not a thing that happens. <laughs> yeah, there was no like, we all need to walk off this giant fried food lunch that we had. Let's, yeah, let's go around the block and we'll. Yeah, just I loved shit. that the walking around. We would do that during our. Yeah, we'd eat lunch and then we'd go for these hour long walks and come back and mm -hmm. go into the editing bay and watch you know dailies or cuts of stuff. Like there's all the the camaraderie of of it that you know as a comic book you know nerd who worked at home my whole life like those parts of it i was like oh this is totally different and fun <laughs> oh art department people i can go in and get and talk to those people and see what the show is going to look like and yeah. you know like there yeah. was parts of it i i don't think you know i learned it was it was hard on the reference show because i was for for about half of it i was the only writer and then we brought on my friend Allie to to you know help you know do rewrites and stuff um mm -hmm. But those were weird work days because we were working at, you know, I would sometimes meet him there at seven in the morning and we would work for three hours before he went and shot all day or something. Well, and I would, or I would meet him at 10 o'clock at night after he'd been shooting all day and we'd work <laughs> until two in the morning. And, you know, so I wasn't, I would not be around the office a lot after that because I'd be like, I, I just have to go home and write. Like I, I gave Darius Kanji my office pretty quickly when I realized like, I'm going to be in the conference room in meetings or at home doing rewrites. Like clearly, like I'm not, I don't, I do not need an office. <laughs> it is a luxury. Darius, Darius needs an office. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's just a weird job where, you know, you end up using your technical skills a lot more in a, in a way than I think people realize that they're going to in a weird mm. way. I think everybody assumes when they're going to do a TV show or a movie, like, cause you know, you know, in the old days when you wanted to work in TV, you had to write an episode of a different show. Like you wrote an ER or a gun smoke. Yeah. You had to spec something to show that you could mimic the voice of another show that was currently on the air. Yeah. And then you could get hot. Cause it's like, Oh, this guy knows how to do that. And, mm -hmm. but for the entire time I've been working in TV, you write spec pilots. So you're showing that you can come up with your own thing. And then getting hired because they're like, oh, this is interesting. This guy's got an interesting writing style. Mm -hmm. Come write, like, come write our show and we will, and, and you won't be able to do any of that. You'll be there. Yeah, we'll, we'll, but your technical music. skills are good and you have a good imagination. And so it's, it's a really fascinating job. I, I think, you know, it's one of those things you really have to love. You really, I mean, you have to be a writer you know, mm -hmm. instinctively to want to put up with how hard it is to make a living as a writer anyway. Yeah. Like think about all the people who write novels who work regular day jobs outside of a creative field at all. Mm -hmm. And their life is waking up three hours early so they can work on their novel every morning or staying up late so they can work on their novel every night. And these people are still publishing books and, you know, and are creative forces that are writing their stories and, you know, it's just an incredibly hard field to be lucky enough to make a living in, you know, mm -hmm. and so you kind of have to remind yourself of that all the time. And then also, like, if you want to work in TV, it's like, I decided that I wanted to work in TV while watching an episode of like Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or something. I just finally was like, you know what, I should just try and work in TV. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing so much stuff that I love. That's like the kind of stuff that I wish I could write more of in comics and, mm -hmm. you know, and I just thought this is, you know, this is a serious medium now. Like I love TV as a kid. I would have happily like taken a job writing episodes of the twilight zone, you know, which had ended years before I was born, but still <laughs> like, you know, or I would have written for Dobie Gillis <laughs> or Gilligan's Island, <laughs> but, but like really thinking about it as like a creative endeavor, like I didn't, you know, I didn't ever imagine that you could have the kind of, 
uh, freedom. I just assumed it was just like a glamorous job right. to work in TV or film. I assumed, you know, because because I watched movies <laughs> and TV shows. So I assume that the lives of the people who work in these things are like that. And in reality, they're all just people working jobs. They're just the same as, you know, every now and then a movie star stops in, but they don't want to be treated like one. So, right. So, no, like, I'll just have a salad like everybody else does. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just going to sit. You know, I was having lunch with Toby Jones one day on set at a Marvel thing, and I just thought, this guy just seems like a guy who likes a lot of the same movies as me. <laughs> you know, I was like, I know he's one of the best actors working right now, and he's there to just do voiceover as Arnim Zola. <laughs> <laughs> and and here I am having this lovely lunch with him. But it's really, it's like a factory town, and like the jobs are jobs. Like eventually that becomes ingrained into you that it's like, this is work and it's a job, and we're making TV shows. I heard Vince Gilligan in an interview say it's just as hard to make a bad episode of a show as it is to make a good one. And you don't mm. know when you're making it, which one it's going to turn out to be. And yeah. I, that was like a revelation to me to hear that. Cause I just thought, here's a guy who I think just about everything he's written is genius. You know, even his crazy episodes of the X-Files, which were always the weirdest ones. As I recall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, and here's him, someone who's been in the industry for that long. And it's like, yeah, everybody, you know, everybody has those moments where they're like, well, that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was a huge lesson for me as well, because I, I, I think I like you started. I, I was a critic for a long time. Yeah. You know, I was a video critic. I was a movie critic. I, I, I did a bunch of uh, criticism for Entertainment Weekly specifically. Yeah. And I could be brutal on things because, yeah. you know, to a certain degree, that's part of the job, but also it was easier. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the venom flu slipped faster. Hating yeah. or loving a thing is much easier than just having to write about a thing you understood and appreciated, but didn't, yeah. didn't totally. hate. It was much easier to, you know, to interview, to review a movie I really despised than something like the Stallone Judge Dread, where I'm just like, I mean, yeah, it's a movie. <laughs> yeah, like B minus is the hardest grade to give because it's like, yeah. you know, it's not like awful. It's not good. It's just kind of. Eh. I remember that you were a known like critic when you came into writing comics at Wildstorm back in the day. I remember. That yeah. was like a, a bone of contention in, a, in, in among some people. It's like, well, why is this guy getting hired? He's a critic, and and everybody being like, oh, he's a good writer, though. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like that, that was that part is, of that, is that was part of my big thing. pitch early on. Was like, listen, guys, I've been working for a weekly magazine for nine years. Yeah, I haven't missed a deadline. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. this is a periodical business, and so like even if it's not great, because it won't be, because these are my first comics. I'll be on time. It's like you'll you'll have your scripts. But you also had chops and you knew comics. Like I didn't read your first comics and think, oh, this looks like a guy who's going to be good someday, but seems very amateurish. I just thought, oh, this guy's good. He knows how to write comics. Like I didn't, there was there were no obvious bumps yeah. you know, of like first timerness. That's, that's kind of you to say because now that I read those comics back every now and again, I'm like, ooh. Oh yeah, no, I can't even. I can't look at my stuff from when I first started out. I'm like, why did I think I could put 85 words in a balloon? <laughs> what was wrong with me? Just break it into three balloons in one panel. What is wrong with you, Brubaker? <laughs> you used to letter. <laughs> you know better. Yeah. What is a what's what's a day in what's a day in the life of Brubaker? What's what's your writing day feel like? Well, I'll tell you my ideal one, which I haven't been hitting a lot this year, just because this year has been a, a little bit of a roller coaster ride on mm. home life stuff. Um, but ideally, I get up early in the morning. Whenever I wake up, I don't set an alarm. I'll just wake up sometime before the humanity has risen. Usually while it's still dark, I like to try to get the last hour of darkness into the day before LA or wherever I'm at at the time totally wakes up and I'll look at whatever I've written. Sometimes I'll check my email first. If I'm smart, I'll wait to do some writing before I check my email. Um, but uh, I try to, you know, on the, on the days when I'm sticking to my plan, I get up and I open my file from the day before and I look at 
whatever the last, you know, four or five pages that I've written of whatever thing I'm working on. And I try to do, you know, before I really do anything but drink a cup of coffee, I try to, you know, just keep working on whatever that was. If I'm if I'm in the middle of a scene, I'll try to finish that scene and hopefully start the next one. I usually try to not end um end a day of writing uh without leaving something like partly there for the mm-hmm. next day like even if it's just the opening line of narration or a description or like okay and this is what happens next a little jotted note for myself so that when I sit down like if I finish a scene and then I'm like all right I'm wrapped for the day the next morning sitting down to write will take a lot longer than if I've got like fragments of the narration for the next page. Cause then mm-hmm. I can sit down and be like, Oh, okay. I'll start fixing that. And, you know, oftentimes I'll write temp things and I'll do it in italics. I'll be like, and then something like this, this, and this. And then I look at that and I realize like I wrote it so quickly that it actually is kind of eloquent and I'll just <laughs> rejigger it a little bit and change some of it so that it's like an I instead of a he or something. And then he does this. They'll be like, and then I did this. <laughs> um, but that really helps me, you know, keep the momentum of something going. Um, and I'll try to put in, you know, two to four hours. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll write a little bit, you know, while I'm drinking coffee and then I'll have breakfast and then I'll try to put in, you know, two to four hours in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'll try to, you know, catch up on, you know, business emails and whatever phone calls I might have to answer. And and then, you know, maybe get, you know, on a day that's not too hot, like today was too hot. But uh, I'll go out and ride my bike down to the L.A. River and just kind of ride the L.A. River back and forth for an hour or two and think mm-hmm. about, you know, whatever needs to happen next in the screenplay or the comic script or whatever and you know get a little bit of that out and sort of try to save myself from having sat for five or six hours straight at a computer (laughs) (laughs) which seems great when you're in your 30s but when you're in your 50s you're like oh i'm killing myself great this is wonderful (laughs) i'm turning i'm literally turning to stone in front of this thing (laughs) but um that's my ideal working schedule would be to do that five to seven days a week get up spend two to three to four hours just writing and then get away from it and just do the thinking, reading, research, notebooking. But, you know, two to four hours of actual typing on pages is I think about all my body and my brain can really handle. Mm-hmm. I always remember Kurt Vonnegut wrote from eight in the morning until noon. And he said in his experience as a writer, he'd learned that he couldn't be he couldn't be required to be intelligent for more than four hours a day consistently. And so he chose to put those four hours into his writing. (laughs) (laughs) And like a lot of writers I've noticed will say that, like, uh, um, you know, look, uh, John Le Carre, uh, you know, said, you know, give the first part of your day to your writing. So he would get up early and have tea and just sit on his couch with his notebooks for two or three hours. I know um, Walter Mosley gets up and I believe, still in whatever he slept in he literally gets up and just sits sideways in bed and has a desk next to his bed and he hand writes in his notebooks that way for two hours every morning and that's how he writes a book or two every year and he does that seven days a week he said he did that the day of his father's funeral like a lot of when you get but i feel like that's really that's the ideal. Like I, you know, I have enough work that I could literally be doing that. And I've just, I've had some frustrations where I'm, you know, not sticking to my schedule. So I'll have a couple days where I don't get writing done and I'm on the phone, you know, talking movie, you know, job stuff with people or helping someone on, you know, their outline or something like that. And so it's like some, sometimes my days are so divided up that I don't, make the time later in the day to just devote two or three hours to sort of shut down email and turn off the phone and all of that and really just focus. And I find the later in the day it gets, the harder it is for me to not just be like, ah, I'll just do it tomorrow. Mm. So, Like if I don't get anything done by noon, 
you know, sometimes I'll be seven or eight at night sitting at the computer just trying to make sure I get at least a page or two written that day. Um, Because I always have, you know, the the great thing, I think, for me is Sean Phillips. Like, I mean, there's a lot of reasons Sean Phillips is the great thing for me. But (laughs) but the fact that he is so prolific and he, you know, is is always needing pages and, you know, so he helps me get out of my way on decisions a lot. Like if I get too far ahead of him on something, I'll start agonizing over every decision I'm about to make. And then when I see he's five pages behind me and he's going to need pages soon, suddenly all the decisions become much easier to make. And I, and usually I end up realizing that the thing that I thought of first that I wanted to do that I started second guessing myself about was actually the right thing or the daring thing or like, you know, okay, well, maybe I started second guessing myself because I was worried about how people would react to that. And, you know, I, that's another thing I always, you know, try to tell people as a writer too, you cannot think about the reader while you're writing. Like, and a lot of writers do. And they uh, like they they've no one's ever like no writing professor has ever told them that like you're writing the story. Sometimes I'm writing a story and suddenly I'm like, I don't know where this is going exactly. Like I know the end of the story, but I don't know the next 30 pages of this. And Mm. and I'm like, fuck, what is it going to be? Sometimes stories go in a darker place than I thought they were going to. (laughs) And you just have to follow like the truth of these characters And I think I see people sometimes being worried. They're like, oh, but if I write something this dark, people will think that I'm that way. And it's like, no, like we all have all these things inside of us. We contain multitudes. Everybody that you've met, if you're an intelligent, creative person on some level, almost everybody you've met, you've at least briefly imagined an inner life for that person and what their you know, like anybody who's made an impression on you, if you thought about that, you'd be like, what is their home life? Like, what do they do? Mm-hmm. What is, you know, what is their, you know, they go out, to, they go out to bars a lot more than I do. Like, what's that like? Like, we all think about that and put ourselves in the heads of all these different people. That's what's great about being a writer is that you can look at so many different sides of all of these situations and all of these people and try to put yourself in their head. I mean, it's not always easy. And, you know, a lot of people do a really shitty job of trying to write (laughs) people whose experiences are so completely different than theirs, you know, but at the same time, there are a lot of people who are really good at it, who can Mm. write anybody, you know, or any, or any situation and make it believable because they put in like whatever work they needed to do to actually understand what they were writing about. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do, I think in similar to you, I do deeply believe that you should be allowed to write anything. There there, there shouldn't be walls between who you are and what you write. Yeah. But you have to do the work. Yeah. Like that's, that is the actual arbiter of it, which is, are you going to do the work to understand that person's life and why that life is different from that other person's life? Yeah. And, And get under the hood of it and see the truth of it and then find ways to dramatize all that. Like, if you can yeah. do that, then yeah, write it, write it all. Like, be yeah, great. exactly. But if you're not going to be great, then maybe don't walk on the lawn you shouldn't be walking on. If yeah, use something like The Wire as an example, where it's like, I don't care who wrote The Wire, because it's a work of art. Like, everybody, yeah. everybody who worked on that thing made something that the people who lived that world were like, that's a, that's amazing. Yeah, that's you know? who we are. That's yeah. us. That's and that done. that to me is like that's the high water mark. Obviously, <laughs> no one's no <laughs> one's gonna hit that every time. But but that's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, if that's what you're really passionate to write about, it's like I didn't. I was really passionate to write about late '40s Hollywood. Mm. So I spent, you know, I, I think a year and a half on research after, you know, 20 years of reading books about old Hollywood, just because I was fascinated by it. So just, but getting very specific research and all of that stuff is so much, you know, to the point where I was watching old movies, but then also trying to track down old interviews with people on the radio to be like, because that's going to be more like what people really talked like, because movies are scripts, you know? <laughs> it's like, so trying to get like, oh, what things did people say back then that they wouldn't say now? And, and you know, because for me, it's all about like trying to, 
trying to find some moment of truth. And, you know, when you're writing a period piece, obviously something about what you're writing is reflecting a truth that's inside of you, but you're using this past era to talk about it in a different way so that people, it's much easier to talk about something like racism if you're writing about a, a story that takes place in 1948, you know, in some ways, or, you know, then it, then it might be to, to write one about what's going on in the country or the world right now, because people will read a story from 1958 and think about the context. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's not so in your face and like choosing, you know, like, it's just, I don't know. I find it very helpful to, to be able to, to write about the way the world feels right now by writing about the way it felt back then too, in mm -hmm. a strange way, like, you know. Well, it's the, it's also the same thing. It's, it's genre. Yeah. In that genre allows you a certain bit of distance from the subject you're writing about, even though you're hundred percent writing about it. You yeah. Know? And so like science fiction as genre gets to do that sort of historical fiction as genre gets to do that. Yeah. You know, like the Twilight Zone got to do that in almost every episode. So what are, what is this one about? Oh, this is about McCarthy. Yeah. This one's about racism. It's amazing. About yeah. For years, I wanted to do a biopic or a miniseries about Rod Serling. Mm -hmm. I want to try to get Bill Hader to play him because I think he'd be perfect. Oh, it'd be amazing. Um, but his story is so fascinating because, you know, he came home from the war from like Korea or something like shell shocked. And, you know, I think a package fell on the guy standing right next to him from an airdrop. So he was like killed by friendly fire airdrop. And so the Jesus. guy and that like, I think scarred him and, you know, but he became one of the two biggest writers in like original TV, him and Patty Chayefsky were the, the two like Titans of that era. And he quit to start the twilight zone, which everyone made fun of him for. Like, people thought this was the biggest mistake. He's got the greatest career. But one of the reasons he quit was because when they did a rebroadcast of um, Requiem for a Heavyweight, mm. there's a line where someone says, you got a match. And the sponsor of the show was a lighter company, so they made them change it to a lighter, and then they used the sponsor's lighter, and that was just the last straw. It was like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm making works of art. I am not making things, you know, I'm not making product placement. Yeah. Um, he was so incensed about the censors and the, and the studios basically just changing things because of the sponsors. And so he decided he'd do this crazy, you know, sci-fi anthology thing and it ended up being you know a huge pop culture touchstone it changed the culture but he also got to write about all the same stuff that he wanted to but no one fucked with it yeah you know genre is brilliant for that i i remember when i first started reading mysteries like i'd grown up watching mystery movies and watching film noir and you know uh, my dad was obsessed with uh, taking us to like the Hercule Poirot movies when they came out and stuff, but I'd never really been much of a mystery reader. I read noir books like Jim Thompson and, you know, the, all the black lizard writers, but for some reason, mysteries I hadn't really read. And um, I was working at this bookstore on Castro street in the nineties. Um, it was this little used bookstore and this author came in one day to drop off like uh, some of his books to see if we'd sell them. And it was this gay author who was like a lawyer and he wrote murder mysteries about this, this lawyer in the LA and San Francisco gay communities. And, you know, and, and it was interesting because in the book, he was talking about all these social issues that I was seeing happen all around me in, you know, the Castro, including like things that, people couldn't really discuss in a way because it was so controversial mm -hmm. in that, like, especially during that time period, the AIDS activists, there was a split amongst AIDS activists that no one really talked about much at the time where it was like, there were AIDS activists who were HIV positive and there were AIDS activists who were not. And the one, the HIV positive ones sometimes would get so extreme that they thought if you, if you didn't have, if you weren't HIV positive, you weren't really part of the fight because it wasn't really affecting you in the same way. And it was like this weird little internal schism in a, in a small, you know, community, but it was the first time I'd ever seen it come up in a work of fiction. Like someone was talking about that. And I just thought, 
oh, that's really interesting. And then I was talking to uh, another person who worked at the store and they were like, oh, that's what I love about like mystery novels and stuff. They always talk about stuff that's going on in the culture and they're able to address that stuff by wrapping it around a murder mystery. And so these are the things that are just part of the characters' lives and they're able to address it without it feeling like didactic or, mm. you know, like a polemic. It's like, oh yeah, like there was one that there was like a, a stand in for a Marion Barry type who was like a, a guy who'd gotten convicted, a politician for the Latino community in the book, but who'd gotten convicted of a bunch of drug crimes and gotten out and ran for reelection and got elected. And it was about how, you know, these communities are so desperate to have a voice that they'll be totally forgiving of their politicians if they're still going to come back and be the voice for them. It's like, hey, we don't have a voice, so we don't give a shit if he's books crack. (laughs) (laughs) So it was like, it was interesting to see someone addressing that in crime fiction when, you know, I read plenty of straight literary fiction. And, you know, I'm always pointing out that some of the best straight literary fiction books are actually crime novels. Like The Mm. Great Gatsby is one of my favorite crime novels. Like yeah. literally, it's about a bootlegger and it's a murder story. <laughs> it's also like one of the most tragic, like heartbreaking books that you'll ever read, too. So it's yeah. like they're not exclusive. And I think, you know, I, yeah, I mean, that was that was part of my my discovery working on Castle Rock, which was like I read a lot of Stephen King as a kid because we all did because it was fucking everywhere. It was Stephen King. Yeah. But kind of getting under the hood of those books and then realizing it's like, oh, this guy is actually one of the great character writers in American letters. But we don't think of him as such because it's Tommyknockers and it's Cujo and it's Christine. Yeah. And it's like the horror of it has kind of overwhelmed in the public opinion the fact that he's very, very good at yeah. building characters and then crashing the supernatural into them. Yeah, it's really weird. To, I actually have gotten into him later in life in a mm-hmm. way. Like I read some of his stuff when I was growing up because everybody was. Mm-hmm. And and I always thought that Different Seasons book was my favorite thing, which was those four short stories mm-hmm. that had, you know, and three of them were turned into movies, <laughs> of course, because <laughs> everything is. But um, but they all got turned into pretty good movies too. Yeah. Um, but uh but like I noticed that about him. I was reading The Outsider, I think was my first thing where I read it and I couldn't put it down. And I just, I loved almost all the characters in it and the way the story was being told. And I I loved that it felt like a murder mystery that you knew early on, like something is off here and it's Stephen King. So you're expecting supernatural, but yeah, the, the, the way he, blended the supernatural into the story and also managed to, in the book, there's a whole luchador uh, Mm -hmm. storyline, which is left out of the TV show, which I'm, I feel was like, that's like leaving the heart out of it. (laughs) (laughs) The luchador women movies was sounded amazing, (laughs) but, but, um, but yeah, I, I found that I was like, I love all of his characters, like even just minor characters in his story is end up having so much, real life and trauma and you know also man he doesn't at all worry about like our viewers gonna think this is too far like nothing he writes does he ever think for a second oh i hope people don't get sick when they're reading this (laughs) you know and it's like that's what i think about a lot when i'm you know when i'm writing it's like okay well is this too much or is this is this delving into too much darkness inside, you know, humanity and which means that that piece of darkness is somehow inside my mind too. And am I revealing? It's like, you can't think any of that stuff because you just have to be true to your story. You know, even if you're going to have your character do something really awful, it's like, well, he's not me. (laughs) Also, story, it's not actually (laughs) happening. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't understand that compulsion that I see sometimes from fans. Uh, you know, when I used to be on social media, I it never I, I never got it aimed at me, but sometimes I'd look at like TV shows I liked and you'd see their fan base like yelling at them about things that the characters did or decisions characters made. And I was just thinking like, I don't know. I mean, people do lots of weird stuff. Like not everybody always has to be the most virtuous person. Sometimes it's interesting when a virtuous person does something bad or you know or like you know 
in Batman, like, like if there's a portrayal of Lucius Fox, where he's not the most, you know, benevolent person who ever mm-hmm. lived of all time, like, what if he's, what if he's greedy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like a normal human businessman might be. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's weird. I, I think that, you know, you have to think about that more, like what's interesting to the story, what's, what's honest to these characters necessarily for whatever story you're telling too. Yeah, I mean, I think that that you know, in for for the largest part of the audience, they first came up against that. It, it, as far as I can kind of recollect, was Game of Thrones. Was oh the God. awful things are happening to people that you love, and yeah. the people that you love are doing awful things. Yeah, and and the 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 lesson always became like, listen, nobody, there's no fan who would have asked for the red wedding. Oh my God. But the story needed the Red Wedding to happen. And it's <laughs> necessary for it to work. Like, that's where these characters were going. That's really interesting. Because you say, no, I, I agree with you. No one reading the book when they saw the Red Wedding coming <laughs> was happy. Everybody, but you couldn't put it down. Yeah. The people who wanted the Red Wedding to happen in the TV show were all the people who read the book so they could watch their friends. <laughs> It was like, oh, they were like, oh no, you got to come me? over for this episode. Trust me, this is the best episode. You're, you're going to be so happy. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it's like but, that's that's yeah. what great story can do. Like it, it takes you to places you didn't think it would go, and that a fan would never ask for. It is yeah. never, it's never fan service. Yeah, it's, it's give me what I need, not what I want. Remember if, when you were a little kid? Did you ever when you were a kid in elementary school? Did the teacher read books to you? Yeah. Like we, when I was in third grade, I remember they read us Where the Red Fern Grows, mm. which is a classic book I'm going to spoil for, because no one's going to read this book that's watching this podcast. Mm. It's a book about a kid who gets two hounds who hunt raccoons. It's like a 50s or 40s period piece or something. His dogs both die, save, keeping him alive while he's freezing in the wilderness at the end of the book and it's like no one in our class or anyone who ever read that book wanted those dogs to die but it was a heartbreaking touching story that everyone has remembered for that heard that book or read that book as a kid you can never forget those dogs saving that kid's life yeah it's like sometimes that's what a story demands is something shitty to happen to your favorite person in the book. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's half of drama. You have comedy, you have tragedy. And yeah. so, like, <laughs> give me the tragedy. Like, I, I like Flowers for Algernon is one of my favorite stories oh my as a God. kid. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking in every way I think can be heartbreaking. But, like... Oh, I didn't get to the end. What happened? No. <laughs> Happily ever after, man. He was the smartest guy in the world. And I was like, oh, I'll catch the end of this at some point. Yeah, like, I know where this is going. I know, really. Oh, wow. Oh, so he became smart, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Now ran for president and everybody wins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you start yeah. being there. Uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, that feeling of like, yeah, no bad shit like, into every life, a little rain must fall is part of the reasons why we ingest story. It's part of the reasons why, you know, yeah. the human existence is what it is. And so to pretend that it's not going to happen, to pretend that everything should go the way you want it to go, as a as a customer, as a reader, yeah. as a viewer, and it's like just tell me your story, man. Like some of it I'm going to like, some of it I'm going to hate. But what's this story according to you? And there's something too about like creating an, an experience for somebody. I mean, sometimes you do have to think in terms of the larger pop culture around something. Because it's like, you don't want to kill off a character if that's been the trend that's happening everywhere, then it's more surprising not to. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do the thing that just feels like a trope to you. So sometimes, even if logically you're like, "Eh, this person should die now or get tortured to death or something, it's like, yeah, that's been happening too much. I'm going to do something else. But that's the weird part about it is when you think outside of that. But, But I do agree. It's like... The and Game of Thrones had it so rough because they, I think that show started like right around the same time Twitter <laughs> existed. <laughs> you know, like it's like before that, you couldn't get into, you couldn't really give your opinions to the people running your TV shows. Like I was thinking about this recently, as you know, I read some article that Kieran Gillen uh, sent around in his newsletter called "The Internet Is Already Dead." 
or something like that. And it was, I don't totally understand everything the guy was saying because I'm not as internet savvy as the guy who wrote it, but mm. he was basically sort of saying it's already in its death spiral and, <laughs> and we all sort of secretly know it and want it to happen. And, um, you know, and it made me think about, like, just think about how many social media driven news cycles you've watched happen and how tired of them you are. Mm -hmm. Like, I never need to hear about Florence Pugh ever again or Olivia <laughs> Wilde. Like, I don't care, like, what they're doing. Like, they just made a movie, it seems like. Um, <laughs> but, but how many news cycles are taken up? Like, almost every time a TV show comes out now, like, there's weeks of news cycles where the cast has to stand up to online trolls about stuff and i'm like mm -hmm. you don't have to do any of that you can just ignore those people completely like standing up to them is giving them what they want to large degree i don't think you know a few thousand people on twitter and facebook really make any difference to a show that's being watched by 40 million people and like in the old days there was like a crank file, like people had to send, I'm sure Betty Davis and Judy Garland and every actor in the world got death threats and hate mail every, you know, like mailed to the studios and stuff. <laughs> but people went through the mail and pulled out the nice ones and threw the other ones in the bonfire or sent them to the FBI if they seemed like a serious threat. Like people didn't necessarily think it was a great idea for actors or creative people to personally interact with trolls you know <laughs> like but yeah. now it's just like i hear of actors who it's in their contract that they have to maintain a social media presence 100 percent. and it's like i would never be yeah. like take a job where they said oh and by the way you have to spend x amount of time on social media every week i'd be like i mean Why? there there are there are choices in casting somewhat based on how big of a social media following do you have? Oh, I've seen that many times. You yeah. know, and so the 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 idea that that is where you sell a show because commercials don't work, you know, yeah. trailers don't work. So that you have to go where the people are. The people are on TikTok and they're on Instagram and they're on Twitter and they're on Snapchat and they're on whatever. And or like, you could just make something like The Bear, which I didn't see any advertising for and everybody loved. <laughs> that was a huge hit. <laughs> right. Or, or, but that is also, that's the, the weird inverse of yeah. 12,000 people loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else knows it exists. Hey, come on. I live in Silver Lake. Everyone loved it. <laughs> I heard it playing from my neighbor's windows. <laughs> Uh, uh, listen, yeah. let me let you go. We we talk, we said we talked for an hour, and it's been a little bit over the hour. Um, but I just want to like to to leave to leave the people with a thing, to leave the people with something actionable, to leave the people oh, with yeah. uh, with something that they can they can apply if they're a, an aspiring writer, if they're looking to make a career shift, they're looking for whatever. If you yeah. have to give a person a piece of advice instead of uh, just bitching about the industry for an hour. <laughs> which we could have done for another five. Well, right? I I will say the thing that I always try to tell to people, I mean, you know it, you're a writer, you've been a writer your whole life, whether you wanted to be or not. Like that's a thing about writing is like you either you either you are a writer or you aren't a writer. At some point it will become clear to you because you will continue to have to write no matter what else is going on in your life. So like if you want to write TV, there's lots of ways into that now. Like when I started trying to get jobs in TV, having been a writer in comics meant nothing at all. <laughs> like they, that was a literally like only people's assistants knew people from comics. Now all the studios are run by people who grew up reading comics <laughs> who were those assistants. But it's like, it really is a thing where, you know, you can't give up on it. But I feel like real writers, like real writers, but like people who are really just like, this is who they are. That's their, that's their identity. Like they couldn't give up if they wanted to like, mm. no, you know, even Salinger supposedly just continued writing for 40 years without letting anybody see it. But you know, it's like, if it's in you, it's in you. I, I used to think it was just comics, like that comics was almost this curse. Cause you always, cause it's such a beautiful art form and it's a simple like one to three people can you know make a thing with almost with no budget basically mm. and you know <laughs> it's an elegant art form words and pictures it's just so simple 
And I thought comics was a thing that was like, if you fell in love with comics young enough, you were just cursed to want to do comics for the rest of your life. But I feel like it's it's like that with any kind of creative endeavor, really, is because I know now so many people in film and TV that, you know, have suffered through how hard it is to get a TV show made that they love or a movie made that they are really proud of. And yet the second they're done with it, they can't wait to get back to doing it again. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, it is such a hard industry to make a living in or make anything good. You know, it's a miracle that any of them get made at all. And any of them coming out brilliant is just like, holy shit, I guess someone stayed out of someone's way or someone trusted someone or <laughs> just or just everything came together perfectly. And this one worked. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of the best ones didn't end up making any money. So, <laughs> you know, so it's it's even more of a miracle when like a fight club happens or something, because it's like that movie lost money and we still talk about it 20 mm-hmm. something years, 23 years later. But yeah, that's my my advice to people is just kind of like there's so many paths in now for everybody that, you know, if you're passionate about that stuff, just keep at it and find your paths in. You know, all the studios, I think, have, you know, train screenwriting, TV training programs. Now, I know a couple people who've gotten into full time TV careers over the last 10 years who went through those programs. You know, which is insane to think that that actually is a thing. Mm. They'll they'll train you how to write TV shows for them, and then they will hire you to work on them. (laughs) But, you know, not everybody can get in those, but it's like there's all these pathways in, and I feel like, you know, they're making more TV and film now, at least TV, they're making more TV than has ever been made in the history of, you know, the universe. (laughs) Unless there's a planet somewhere we don't know about that has nine Netflixes. <laughs> but what would your what would your you know positive writing thing that you would say to people? I mean, I it's it's similar to yours, but probably less optimistic than yours. Oh. Because because I do think I do think that writers will write and they, yeah. they and it's a thing that if it's if it's in you, you're gonna do it, and there's probably no way for you to stop it. But I would, I would, I would advise a person who wants to be a writer to not be hung up with the medium you're writing in, because like as much as we make more TV now than we ever have, it's still a job where four thousand people hold. Yeah, you know, and it's still very, very hard to find a way to get over that hill. Um, you know, but if what you want to do is tell mystery stories, you can write novels, you can write comics, you can write shit that you put on the internet. You can write, you know, you can do a Substack email. Like all of it is available yeah. to you in ways that it had never been before. If you want to make a movie or you want to make your own TV show, you have a movie studio in your pocket. You yeah. can write, shoot, edit, post, put the music on and distribute without ever putting your phone down. Like all of that is now possible. But to divorce success from accomplishment, yeah, like you can still be fulfilled in making a thing that you show to your friends and your family, and then you maybe put up on the internet. Maybe somebody sees it, maybe they don't. But you made the thing. I will say too that I I know some incredibly successful people from comics and film. I don't think I know any single person who ever completely feels like they've really gotten there all the way. Like even the most successful people I know. They're still, they still want one more thing. There's still one more further, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, uh, you have to look around every now and then. And even like, even me, I'm like, like it, it took me up until a couple of years ago. I just kept always hoping that Sean and I would be able to continue doing our books. And then someone mm-hmm. pointed out that we'd been doing them for 18 years. And I was like, yeah, but I keep waiting for one of them to be a huge hit. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, they're all kind of hits. <laughs> so all kind of hits. it's like, you can, you can, you know, work for a long time without realizing that you've, you've achieved a modicum of success and not appreciate it because writers do have that, especially in TV or Hollywood. It's like, I can't imagine being someone who writes like tentpole movies or something like that. And yet every time I see Michael Green hired for a job, I'm like, I could have written that. (laughs) (laughs) I would have written Blade Runner. No, I probably probably wouldn't have written Blade Runner. (laughs) Just out of just out of fear of Ridley Scott, yeah. how much I loved the first movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's it. It's just you know, be be realistic, but be ambitious. And if you yeah. can do anything else, 
you probably should. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you can, if there's something else that you can do and make a living at, like my dad worked, you know, military intelligence and contracting and stuff his whole life. He wanted to be a writer. He still wrote on the side. Like when he, when he passed away, he'd written, I think he'd done like one novel that, you know, eventually I'll try and get published. And and he'd written like the first draft of a sequel to it that were like these Vietnam spy stories that are loosely based on his real life, actually. Wow. So I was like, wow, he never really stopped. Like he had years where he wouldn't write, but he always still had that, you know, ambition to to do that. So Yeah. And even if it's not your day job, it can be your safety valve. Oh, and, yeah. And, I uh, mean, I will say if you're a person who works in comics and also in TV or film, that is is such a savior because you don't get as mad about the things that you would get creatively frustrated to the point of just nervous breakdowns when you can wake up every morning and write a few pages of comics that are going to be exactly what you want them to be it's it's much less frustrating knowing that i have one creative outlet that really nobody else besides me and sean you know have any input into it's what we it's exactly what it needs to be you know every time we do it and because working in film it's like there's the director if you're lucky it's just you and the director and a producer mm. you know then you get to the point where there's the studio notes before you start shooting and then there's the studio notes after you're shooting and then there's the studio notes during post <laughs> and, you know so it's like by the time the thing gets made it could be so far from what you thought it was going to be so you have to like also think about those experiences, like who are you working with? Like I will say every time I've ever taken a job that I thought was going to be a great career move for the money or something like that, it's ended up just being like, I wish I hadn't taken the job. I always try to come up with what would be the great, the great, uh, like, uh, jingle for the writers guild and that's like that that smith song i was looking for a job and i found a job and heaven knows i'm miserable now <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect yeah <laughs> so let's end there <laughs> and thank you for taking time out of your day to yeah thank you me about I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw up the book one more time one more time reckless book five follow me down five books in a year and ten months hot damn I know I am so tired right now. Our next book, <laughs> come, our next book comes out next year, and it's a totally different thing that will uh, hopefully I'll come back here and talk to you about that. I would love it. I would love it. All right, man. Uh, be good. Uh, and that is Black Man Beyond for this week. Um, I have been Mark Bernardin. This has been Ed Brubaker. Um, we will you. see you next Black Time, uh, same Black Time, same Black Channel, podcast.com or youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. Um, thank you. Be good. Take care. Be kind to each other, please. Yeah, seriously. And Greetings, everybody. All right. And welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen. And this is what happens when Jay and Sal Bob get old up Kevin Smith. Cheers,